I am, uh, you know, honored to be among all of you uh, Bittenistas, e even though I have never, you know, figured out a way to make kombucha popsicles or <laughs> carbonate bone broth. <laughs> <laughs> or, or to, you know, find a way to compost those wax-covered bazooka bubblegum covers. <laughs> That's disruptive. <laughs> but on... <laughs> I like the dark. It's my home. But, but there's an X on the stage, which, as we've all seen, treasure maps <laughs> means it's the spot. <laughs> anyway, I, 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 got a, I got a call this morning to uh, go take what is known around here as a meeting. <laughs> and I've got to say that you have probably never lived unless you've sat in a room filled with network executives having two people who you barely know pitch your life as a sitcom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was kind of an interesting life. I almost wish that I had it. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, my, my wife was this, you know, hot Chicana who was like a director of development at City Hall and uh, I, I, I had I had a teenage daughter who was passionately involved in um, political causes, and a um, gay 13-year-old son, which would have been news to my actual not gay 13-year-old son, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, whose uh, whose secret passion was cooking and spent all of his times trying to figure out how to do you know, the complicated sauces from the French Laundry cookbook. <laughs> um, I do not think it was a go. <laughs> but oh, the, the, it also had a, uh, there was a part, a, a supposedly a go recurring thing in the series where I would take, uh, I went to see a shrink um, to talk about my fear of deadlines, and my, and my editor slash best friend would go with me. Uh, I, the, the, the laughter is, the laughter is nervous. I can tell some of you have had <laughs> deadlines in your life. But when I was rushing out the door and I picked up the notebook with the talk that I'd sketched out, I noticed that, you know, I. Uh, I noticed um, when I parked and got here that, in fact, I picked up the wrong notebook. <laughs> so unless you want, like, um, a transcript of an interview with Kurt Cobain's girlfriend in 1991, <laughs> 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 or a, um, a, a, a presses of a very nice trip to Italy in the mid-'90s, um, I, I think I was right in leaving the notebook in the bag. <laughs> what I was supposed to talk about is the history of restaurants in Los Angeles. Um, I suppose I, I would have started out talking about Los Angeles's origins as uh, agricultural region, one of the great agricultural reasons in the country, maybe the, maybe the world, um, with oranges so beautiful and so delicious that half of the Middle West found a way to uh, travel here and stay in the last part of the 19th century and the first part of the 20th century, back when it was called Iowa by the Sea. And you can still walk in certain parts of, especially the San Gabriel Valley, especially like um, northern Pasadena or Sierra Madre, and you walk down streets and you notice that there's an orange tree at precisely the same spot in every yard, and you realize that that represents the 
orchard rows that were torn out to build housing uh, around the turn of the last century. Um, I probably would have gone on to talk about the great influence of immigration into Los Angeles. So of course, Los Angeles spent longer as a part of Mexico than it did as a part of the United States. And how you can walk into um, certain, the areas beneath certain uh, freeway overpasses in the south part of the city and see like two acre fields of nopales with men with great sacks bent over harvesting, you know, the beautiful delicious cactus the way that they probably would have a hundred years ago. Um, I would have talked about, you know, going around with two chefs that I know um, who own a beautiful restaurant in Bell Gardens um, and who know every piece of fruit on every tree uh, between, say, Bell and Watts. And they see a ripe guava tree nobody's looking at and they pick guavas. They know who has the most delicious chayote. They know um, who has a, you know, a patch of guava trees that usually go uncollected, so they do it. Some people they have um, arrangements with, so you have some idea of the old part of the city, the agricultural part, the part when Los Angeles County was the single biggest agricultural um, county in the entire United States, which happened, I think, until 1970. Um, and it's not quiet, it's still there under the asphalt, it's still there under the housing developments, it's still there under the massive mini malls. There's this great bounty of food coming up from our rich land watered so well by the Los Angeles River as it meandered banks from time to time. And even where I live up in Pasadena, you walk a couple of blocks and you come across this sunken part of the ground. And it looks like landscaping until you realize that it's not just there because they thought it would be a good feature for the park, it's there because there used to be a stream that ran underneath it, a stream that would meander down and have run the, um, the Molino, the old mill in San Marino, which was where the flower for the San Gabriel mission was made and is possibly one of the oldest artifacts of pure agriculture in Los Angeles. But I'm getting beyond myself, I guess, or, or maybe not beyond myself en enough. <laughs> um, Los Angeles spent most of its existence as not much of a restaurant town. Um, there's a, a famous piece by S.J. Perlman, the New Yorker writer who wrote the first few um, Marx Brothers movies, uh, where he said that um, he was in real trouble because he found himself in Los Angeles at lunchtime and had forgotten to pack a bag of pemmican. <laughs> I think then he went on to make fun of alligator pears. Alligator pears are easy to make fun of. <laughs> um, when my when, when we were kids, a regular field trip that would be taken in Los Angeles, and maybe some of you remember this, is to the spot in the hills of um, La Puente where the um, first Haas avocado tree first popped up as some kind of a mutant. And there's a little plaque by the tree and um, that was obviously probably the most grafted avocado tree, maybe the most grafted tree of all. You know, it went all over the world, avocados are us, we are avocados, and the fact that we put them on toast now is a-okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
my friend Ben Shuri, who runs a fantastic restaurant in Melbourne called Attica, which is the restaurant that we should all dream of. It's a restaurant um, that has an enormous amount of land that's sort of lent to it by the National Trust, where the uh, chefs, as part of their mise en place, as part of the duties for the day, you know, plant and nurture and harvest the plants that will be part of the dinner that they're cooking at their station that night, which, which gives them a sort of relationship with the food that you can almost taste. It's a, it's a lovely thing. Um, Anyway, he posted a picture the other day of this avocado toast that was cross-hashed with this fineness you would think of in like a Durer etching. I mean, there must have been 45 minutes of manual labor into sculpting this <laughs> avocado, which was then sprinkled with Tasmanian caviar and was undoubtedly a really good avocado. <laughs> or avocado toast is as it could be. Um, anyway, thus, having, thus far having failed to um, teach you anything at all about <laughs> the history of restaurants in Los Angeles, uh, I thought I'd read a piece about spam. <laughs> when my friend Barry emailed me about a special dinner he had set up at a local restaurant, a multi-course extravaganza in which every course involved spam. My response was perhaps not as grateful as it should have been. While I have probably enjoyed more than my share of feasts devoted to a single ingredient, it must, many of them at Maud, it must be said that I was already predisposed towards black truffles or spring's first asparagus or lobster or the fall's bounty of shot game. Spam was a different matter. I've always thought of myself as possessing an ecumenical attitude towards Spam. I didn't grow up eating Spam. We were more of a Vienna sausage family. <laughs> but when I encounter the substance as an adult, I try to keep an open mind. I have eaten Spam burgers, which is to say an inch thick slab of Spam seared on a hot griddle and slid onto a toasted hamburger bun with ketchup, mustard, tomatoes, lettuce, all of it. A Spam burger is sort of crisp, the Spam part of it anyway, and abundantly speckled with those crunchy black bits, and it's sort of sweet, actually very sweet, a corrosive, penetrating sweetness that can linger on your palate for about the same length of time as the faded pomegranate notes of a great old coat roti. You've heard of those nuanced lunch counter hamburgers where each ingredient lends its own layer of crunch and the scorched meat patty acts more as condiment than as the meat of the sandwich? This is not that. I have also had Korean bude chige, a spitting cauldron of superheated liquid on a tabletop burner that ejects droplets of orange goo and puffs of sulfurous steam. Those lozenges of pink meat Slice spam straight from the can. Bude chike, sometimes also called Johnson Tang, Johnson Soup, after the US president at the height of its popularity, is a culinary souvenir from the impoverished years after the Korean War, where the readiest sources of protein were canned provisions cadged from the American military bases around Seoul, which were then simmered with an ordinary kimchi soup to make the stew. Sometimes there was also American cheese, Vienna sausages, sliced ham, and prepackaged ramen noodles. It was an early, if inadvertent, sample of what later became fusion cuisine. <laughs> In Hawaii, uh, it is, you should never turn down a chance to try gas station Spam Musubi, triangular bricks of vinegared sushi rice stuffed with pink glistening, glistening slabs of Spam, then rolled like a burrito filling in sheets of dark green seaweed. I have tasted Spam top spaghetti and Gardena coffee shops. Spam is like nothing else in the world of cured meat. It's cloying and sweetly porky, salty, fatty food manufactured for and revered by folks 
for whom salty fatty food was once the ultimate and unobtainable luxury. What were the Melanesians in remote cargo cults praying for when they built American airplanes out of palm fronds? Spam. Lots of spam. In some of the more civilized parts of the Pacific, the average consumption of spam at one time was said to approach a can per day per person. On the other hand, I am neither Melanesian nor from the great Midwest. Spam is not my favorite meat. At this restaurant, though, the spam respecting chef was at a place at which it would be possible to d dine a dozen times without discovering the pink, salty secret at its depth. But as a Filipino born in spam-loving Hawaii, the chef was known to have a different conception of Asian food than chefs whose formal training came in Japan. And his most famous dish was probably crispy pata, which was a crisp, super rich, braised and roasted pork knee that may have used fancy heritage pork and was probably served with a vinegar dipping sauce and rich with foie gras instead of pureed pork liver. But it was otherwise identical to the crispy pata that is served at every Filipino restaurant in town. Did he marinate his fancy pork in the customary 7-Up? It was impossible to tell. Still, as I slid into the booth in the main dining room, seconds before the onslaught of spam was supposed to begin, I couldn't help hoping that the chef had somehow forgotten about the premise of the meal, that we were about to enjoy a tasting of fried bengus or roast piglet instead. The actual menu at the restaurant, after all, was as free of spam as my tenderest dreams. But then out came skewers of grilled spam dusted with sesame seeds, spears of tempura fried spam wrapped around asparagus, and spam wrapped sea scallops, and then little blocks of spam tethered to sushi-sized blocks of crunchy caramelized rice, spam sushi. For once, I remembered my doctor's admonition to leave half of each course on the plate. <laughs> Spam carpaccio was better than I was afraid it might be. Thin slices of Spam brushed with sticky sauce and garnished with slivers of grilled foie gras. The next course was decent too, a plate of bitter charcoal grilled endive and radicchio speckled with clumps of blue cheese and strewn with matchsticks of spam that had been broiled to the crispness of bacon. I thought of it like the Tonga version of a French country salad. At this point, most of the restaurant became aware that we were eating an all spam meal. Other diners started drifting towards our table to see what was up as if we were the guys eating earthworms on Fear Factor. Nobody asked for a bite. <laughs> then came a plate of open-faced Chinese dumplings that had been stuffed with Spam and steamed. The Spam came through a little too strongly on that one. And then small bowls of arroz caldo, which is a lovely Filipino-style rice porridge, a little like kanji, that was dressed with a few shreds of baby bok choy, a nicely poached egg, and a rather punishing quantity of cubed Spam. <laughs> what does one drink with Spam? In our case, a Russian river reverse demeanor. <laughs> a fragrant, bone-dry Alsatian wine whose apple-like acidity was almost high enough to scrub away the linking aftertaste. <laughs> almost. <laughs> Nothing short of Drano, though, would have been sufficient <laughs> to erase the taste of Spam Wellington. This was an entire can's worth of Spam baked in pastry with pureed shiitake mushrooms. The dish was so revolting in its native pinkness, the pastry itself was decorated to look like a pastry can of Spam that even my friend couldn't manage more than a couple of bites. In a battle between Spam and Angelinos, the spam wins every time. <laughs> uh, 
Dessert was a bit of the Filipino purple yam parfait called halo halo that was mischievously served in rinsed out spam cans. <laughs> did we finish it anyway? We did. Thanks very much. <laughs>